Hey guys, this is Keenan Fry and you're watching the Acid Drip. So today we have a really unique project and what I've got laid out in front of me right here is my workbench of tools. So what I want to do is show you the next project that I'm working on. So for starters, um, I've been wanting to do this project since 2017. Um, excuse me while I get adjusted. It was 101 degrees today. So I got my drinks and stuff so I can actually make it outside and not want to like suffocate. But uh, yeah, so I've been wanting to do this project since 2017 and in uh, 18 I really set myself to doing it and still never got around to it. So it's been like about two years that I've wanted to do this. This is a blank C-series guitar body and neck. It's a Strat style, but as you can see, it's got a humbucker slot and a hardtail. Pretty bizarre, right? Um, it's a Japanese made sort of um, uh, knockoff of a Strat. It's one of those um, lawsuit guitars, but it's actually really solid. This is good maple. This is also good maple. Um, definitely some dings and, uh, you know, the frets aren't bad. They're not great either. Um, it really just needs to be cleaned out is really what it is. This isn't a bad guitar. There, there's really actually not a lot of wear on these frets, ironically. Um, even though this is like a very old guitar, there's just not a lot of wear. Um, and I can tell by just how much crap is on the frets because generally if you play your frets a lot, they're actually squeaky clean because the uh, friction from rubbing the strings on there pulls everything off. Also, when you wear your frets down, they get like a flat part on top from constantly being pressed on and the top of the crown wears off. So yeah, there's not too much of that on here, but there are some dings and stuff that I'm gonna buff out. But um, that's kind of like a side project. The real big project that I wanna show you isn't really this. This is something that I'm gonna fool around with I'm going to make it into a death metal guitar. I'm going to get the same pickup that Chuck Schuldiner used on his um, Stealth and uh, throw that into here. And then, you know, maybe I'll record myself playing Secret Face or something like that. But um, that's just like something down the line, like kind of like a pipe dream. The real reason why I'm here and the reason why I have all those parts out is this guy. This is my Fender Explorer, or my Fender, my um, Gibson Explorer, and I have done the unthinkable. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I shaved a Gibson Explorer. I have been shaving the neck and a cutaway into the body. Now, why would anyone do something so horrendous and god awful? Well, one, I'm crazy, I'm an artist, and, and two, to be quite frank with you, um, this guitar hurts to play. <laughs> uh, and before you say, eh, grow up and get over it, um, you know, I'll tell you, no. <laughs> uh, for me personally, guitar is one of those things where, um, yeah, it's exactly that. It's very personal. It's really not about collecting or um, worrying about the value of the instrument. I think that a lot of people are very afraid of altering an instrument and really like its value is only what it is you can get out of that instrument. And right now this Gibson, um, I shaved this kind of like cutaway into it because it was digging into my ribs. And so like the longer I would play with it, the more I'd get this weird line pressed into my ribs. Cause I'm a skinny dude, man. I'm just skin and bones. I do a lot of cardio and stuff, but I'm not very big. I'm not muscular and I don't have any girth. You know, I don't have any fat. At least not yet. Maybe when I'm like in my 30s and I'm, you know, fat off of my wife's great cooking, you know, I'll um, have some more girth. But as it is, I don't have any of that. So I don't have any padding. And so it just digs into my ribs all the goddamn time. And that kind of hurts. And the other thing I don't like about it is it's really hard for me to wrap my thumb around this neck. And I've noticed with most Gibsons, their boat necks, um, at least in comparison to pretty much any Fender I've played. Fenders tend to get narrower at the nut. And I mean, I think Gibsons do a little bit as well, but Gibsons are definitely wider. 
This is probably one of the widest necks I've ever held in my life besides my um, Flying V, which I've also got with me. And I am going to also shave the Flying V. So I'm going to do the unthinkable twice. Twice. Damn it, let me get that on camera. Twice. Yes, that's right. I am going to shave the Flying V as well. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do that. And that's part of the reason why I brought this guy out because this is something that um, I have some experience with. So I, the first guitar I ever shaved was a Ibanez Geo and I completely destroyed that thing. I shaved it so thin, the neck bowed. It just went whoop and it just, it never played again. Then I shaved a Ovation GP. It's the same model. It was a black GP with cream binding. Um, same model that um, Josh Hahn used to play. And uh, it's a beautiful guitar, but I also damaged that guitar as well, but not necessarily because I was shaving it. That guitar, I accidentally knocked over and the headstock snapped and it got reattached. And in the process of reattaching it, the guy who, who did the job um, sanded down the neck a little bit to smoothen it out. And then he changed um, the way the break had occurred by then after smoothening out part of it, roughing the edge up because so what you do is you smooth it up so that it sits and fits neatly on top of each other. Then you get a file and you're roughing it back up because if you put smooth wood on top of smooth wood, it'll slip. But if you put smooth wood on top of smooth wood to line it up and figure out exactly where the neck needs to set. And then afterwards you come in with a rough file, like 60 grit and you rough it up and you put the glue in there, the wood fibers will melt into each other and hold better. So that's something a lot of people don't know when they're trying to reset a headstock. Um, Cause it's really common for Gibsons to snap their headstocks. It's like probably one of the most common um, injuries a Gibson will suffer is the headstock will crack and just completely snap off or any number of things. And it's, it's because of the um, back angle of the nut. So instead of actually putting a string tree on the headstock like fenders or like my fender Mustang uh, right here, I've got a string tree right there. There's the string tree. Instead of putting one of these guys in, they opted for a back bow. And that was probably one of the biggest design flaws that Gibson ever introduced into their guitars because it made them extremely vulnerable to breaks. And the problem is um, since Gibson decided to build their business model off of aesthetics and not really like practicality, um, they opted instead of putting a scarf joint in to just make their necks a solid piece. So that's really like my own personal gripe with Gibson is they didn't scarf joint their necks. Um, Ibanez scarf joints all of their necks on their more like medium lower range models. And to be honest with you, I think it's probably for better design and construction. Jackson does it as well. I think ESP does. Um, but yeah, the scarf joint is basically where the headstock and the neck are two separate pieces and they're glued together and they're glued right below where the nut is, which is the most common place for those guitars to have a break. And because they're glued there, they're far stronger than just a single piece neck like this neck through Gibson right here. So, um, if you get a guitar with a scarf joint, you know, a lot of people say cosmetically it's unattractive, but it's actually a very good design and it will make your guitar um, more resistant to damage and injury. So it's actually, in my opinion, an investment. And if I were a prolific, famous, successful guitarist, of course, you know, one day maybe, but if I was that now um, and Gibson came up to me and asked me to design a custom guitar, one of the things I would require from them is a scarf joint or a bolt on. And that's largely because um, as much as I love the aesthetics of a set neck, and I, I think that's great, um, it's a huge liability. It's a huge liability if the neck breaks. And that's just something that I think is um, unacceptable from a uh, financial standpoint, especially for somebody who's beginning on guitar. So with all that ranting and lecturing sort of out of the way, it's now time to get into the actual project itself. Um, I'm going to actually literally file the rest of this in front of you and I'm going to show you how I go about it and I will be working on both of these spots and if I have time I will bust out the V 
but I will also demonstrate it on this neck first. So um, if you've never done this before, don't destroy a set neck guitar just because you want to shave the neck. Instead, go on to eBay and find a spare uh, neck. Look for one that is quarter sawn and spend a good 75 to 80 bucks on one. I know that that sounds like a lot of money to spend just to destroy a piece of wood, but um, it's better to destroy a $70, $80 neck than to destroy a $800 guitar, which is what I did back when I was 20, you know, about eight years ago, and I wasn't very uh, smart. <laughs> I destroyed my, um, my uh, Ovation GP. It still sits in its case under my bed, but it's not something that I play regularly because of the... Uh, shave job that I did on it. I cut it too close and uh, the neck is a little warped. Um, so yeah, get a, get a spare neck. Now, the first thing you want to understand about a neck like this is what your goal is in, in a job like this. So for me, my goal is to be able to get my thumb basically guaranteed around the first, or sorry, the sixth string and possibly the fifth string. Now that's kind of like a Jimi Hendrix thing is getting your thumb around it like that. Now I can kind of do it like that right now but it's a real pain in the ass. What I really want to be able to do, instead of having the neck where it's like this and it's really squeezed up against my thumb, is what I want to do is have a little bit of space between the cup of my hand and my thumb. Now again, people can argue that that's like a technique thing and you can you know, get better at playing and learn to hold your hand that way. And I wouldn't disagree with them. There is some amount of technique involved, but it also helps to shave your neck. And I'm not the only one who's done this. Jimmy, Hend or Jimmy Page used to do this. Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin used to shave the neck on all of his Gibson Les Pauls. It's a fact. It's a certifiable fact, and I can pull out a book and show it to you if you doubt me in a book on guitar encyclopedias. So with that out of the way, what I want to do now is show you kind of like the prep work that I've done for this and why I did it the way I did. So for starters, if I can get this set up right, so right now, with just the bit of shaving, my thumb, my thumb still has some trouble hooking over it. And I think that I have to take just a bit more off the edge to really get it to smoothen out and get my thumb to really hook over the way I want to and not have to squeeze it as tightly as I, as I, ha I am right now. Show you with the palm. I want it to be more like that. Now you could argue, again, your hand placement has a lot to do with it, but taking the edge off really does help. So how we do that? Well, you're gonna get a rough file and the trick with a rough file is to take your goddamn time and go really bloody slow. I know that um, you know uh, people wanna, wanna rush through things, but haste makes waste. And if you rush this, you will destroy your guitar. So I'm gonna show you a few quick tricks on this one and then we're gonna do some work on the other neck and uh, show you how it goes. Okay. So now that we've got it set up here, I'm going to just kind of move things around a little bit and get this a little bit more focused on over here. So for starters, I have shaved it up towards the headstock, which is one of the things you want to pay attention to when working with a guitar like this, a set neck guitar, you always shave towards the headstock. Uh, it's quarter sawn, which means that the way the wood is cut, um, the grain of the wood is going up towards the headstock. So flat sawn, sawn means that the grain is kind of like neutrally passing through the neck and that means that the neck can wobble side to side over time it can warp and bend. But quarter sawn um, means that the wood is cut differently so that the grain always points upwards towards the headstock and the value of that is it prevents the guitar from warping. So if, if you know the grain is going towards the headstock because it's quarter sawn and on every guitar the neck is quarter sawn. I have, literally never seen a guitar over $300 without a quarter sawn neck. If you go into like the $200, $100 like bullshit, Hondo, whatever, you know, first act guitars, you know, I, I can't help you with that. But with any any um, actual genuine make and model guitar, it's always gonna go to the headstock. So with that said, um, you always move towards it. So I've got my little thing set up here, but I'm probably gonna put it in my lap, to be honest with you, because it's more comfortable that way. And the way I do it, and you'll be able to see some of it, but I'm gonna just focus more on what I'm doing than what the camera is watching. So right now I'm just kind of working on the, on the round edge 
because I want to sculpt this out a little bit. And I always go in one direction, really long strokes. Now here, I'm going to do a little bit because there's what appears to be some grime and I want to take the top layer out. So one of the things that's going to happen is when you shave your guitar, you're exposing it to the elements. So moisture is going to get in there. That's inherent. So what we're going to do when this is all said and done is we're going to hit this with some TSP, which is trisodium phosphate. So trisodium phosphate is going to take all the crap out of this. It's going to get all the grime, all the gunk out, all the dead skin and all the sweat from my hands. Now right here, you can see that I'm kind of going opposite of the grain of the neck. That's because I'm taking the edge of this down and I'm trying to shape this a little bit. Now, as I shape this, I'm being very careful because what I'm working on right here is called the heel of the neck. Now the heel is where the neck sort of sets into uh, the body of the guitar. Now, for a fact, I know this for a fact, on all Gibsons, right below the end, of the uh, neck humbucker, I mean neck pickup, but in this case humbucker, right about here is where the end of the neck socket is. So basically, the the in this case actually because this doesn't have a, a pickup cover or a um, a pick guard, it's a little bit different. But Gibsons with pick guards, the neck will sometimes extend underneath to about here. In this case, it's not. In this case, what's going on is the neck is extending all the way to the edge of the pickup and it's being set. So you've got about this much tongue going through the pickup. So if I put my finger here and I line up my thumb, I'd say somewhere around here on the, maybe more about here. Yeah, about here, about, about that much of this space back here actually has tongue in it. And that means that there's a piece of this neck, this set neck that's going into the body, about that much of it. So while I am shaving one of the most important parts of the neck down, this heel where it seams into the body, it's not gonna be too disastrous as long as I'm very careful and slow and conservative in my work. So it's not really about making big drastic motions or big drastic cuts. It's about going really slow and knowing that you're gonna get there, that you're gonna get there and it's just gonna take its sweet time and you're just gonna go slow and you're just gonna take your time. Yeah, we're gonna be here for a real long time. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that this is mahogany and mahogany is very, very, very porous. And so one of the things that happens is the hair kind of feathers a little bit. It, it um, the wood kind of hairs out and feathers. And what that means is the wood, when you're shaving it, basically what ends up happening is it kind of curls together and comes out a little bit unevenly. And again, that's because mahogany is very porous. Wood has its own unique characteristic depending on the quality of the wood grain. So you're always gonna have to adjust for the personality of the wood. Now in this case, because it's mahogany, it's very soft. That's one of the other reasons why you have to be soft with Gibsons is because most of them are made out of mahogany. And uh, I think that uh, a lot of people argue a little bit too much about the quality of tone wood, whether you know mahogany or maple or swamp ash or oddler, or any number of different woods makes a difference in tone. The only rational discourse I have for tone comes down to mass in ratio to volume. The denser the mass in ratio to the volume, which means a lower volume overall space that the guitar takes up, so volume being length times width times height, the overall volume of the guitar, the smaller the volume and the denser the guitar is, generally speaking, the better the tone. And by better the tone, I mean more sustain. On the other hand, you can have hollow bodies that have excellent tone and are gigantic and they're light as a feather. You know, if you look at any of Brian Setzer's Gretches, obviously they're gigantic. They're bigger than this Gibson. They're maybe at most five pounds. This thing is damn near 20. And um, <laughs> yeah, they're gigantic and hollow, but they have great tone. Um, when I talk about tone, I'm talking about sustain. And again, 
the argument that I'm making is about solid bodies, not about hollow bodies. So solid body guitars generally follow the rule of thumb that I just described to you, that the denser the guitar is in ratio to its mass, that means the lower the mass and the more dense the guitar is, the better the sustain will be. And that's my qualification for telling the amount of sus natural sustain a guitar has. Now here's the thing, okay? Natural sustain isn't as important as people make it out to be. It is important because natural sustain is one of the key characteristics of a good guitar and of a good instrument in general, but natural sustain can be very much supplemented and augmented by digital effects or even analog effects. It doesn't really matter what kind of effects you use, just by using effects you can change the sustain on your guitar. So there's a lot of mythology, a lot of hearsay about, well, you need to use this, or you need to have that, or you're not going to sound good if you're doing this, or you're not going to sound good if you're not doing this, or so-and-so does this. And, you know, there's a lot of hearsay. Really playing guitar is about what it is you enjoy most and what it is you want to get out of working with your instrument. Again, I'm arguably destroying my guitar right now. There are a lot of people who would probably be screaming at the camera are screaming at their computer screens right now, screaming at me if they were here, saying, you're ruining it, you're ruining it, why are you doing this? And, you know, this is an $800 guitar. It was $800 to buy this. I bought it used off of uh, Reverb. Came with a nice hard shell case for $800, um, which is about a fair price for a good Gibson like this. A really good Gibson like this should cost you about $800. If you're spending more than 1000 on a Gibson guitar, you're probably getting ripped off. Um, a good used Gibson is about 800 and you can get a really good used Gibson, really good. This is a really solid, fucking solid guitar. I love this guitar. Um, you can get any guitar you want and make it sound, for the most part, however it is you want with digital effects these days. So it's really about getting your own personal enjoyment out of it and just getting a good deal price-wise because, you know, the further you stretch your money, the more you can do with your equipment. One, you can get better equipment, and two, you don't have to stress the cost of the equipment as much. You know, living in California, which is the most expensive state right now in the country, and not only living in California, but living less than 20 minutes south of San Francisco, you know, um, it's very expensive to live in this area of the country, and I can tell you, you know, it's nice to know that I can work on a budget and still have good equipment. Now, my budget might seem like a lot of money to you. You know, I spent $800 on a guitar and I'm shaving it and I have multiple guitars and I have a lot of equipment in my room that you've probably seen. But again, I didn't have all of this stuff when I started out. I started out back in when I was 16 in 2007. So 12 years ago, I started playing guitar and gathering equipment and supplies and you know I've been very fortunate I've had help from friends and family and mentors so you know I am where I am today because I have had help from very kind generous people and also I've worked very hard for a very long period of time so if you're starting out and you're looking at all of this and you're thinking wow man you know look at all that cool stuff he has I'll never have that don't worry you'll get there one day just make smart purchases and buy what you can afford. Don't ever buy outside of your means because you will actually cause yourself more harm in the long run. You know, one thing that I've learned in all my years of doing this kind of stuff is that the guy who lasts is the guy who wins. And the guy who lasts is the guy who plans ahead. And the guy who plans ahead is the guy who makes the sacrifice. So you got to make sacrifices to get anywhere. You got to choose what it is you're going to commit to. Instead of hanging out with friends or playing around with magic cards, I love to play Magic the Gathering. I'm building a commander deck. Um, Mono Black, Yog Moth, Thran Physician. I'm stoked on that. Um, so yeah, I'm not playing around with stuff like that. I don't particularly play video games largely because they hurt my hands and I really want to devote all my energy and capacity, physical capacity, to playing guitar and making art. So anything that kind of wears out my hands that isn't related to that I try to avoid. 
technically this is wearing out my hands, but it is related to the guitar, so I'm okay with that. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not really hanging out with other people. I'm not hanging out with friends. I'm just hanging out with you. You're my friend, buddy. So it's nice to be hanging out with you watching this video. You know, thank you for coming by the acid drip and watching me do this. Um, but yeah, I make my daily sacrifice to put my time in every day to play my instrument and be committed to the artistic and creative vision that I have. And because of that, I will get there one day. And I'm able to say that because I take my time. That's the secret. Take your time. You have lots of time. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. You have time. You have time. And if you use your time wisely, which means you take your time and you spend it on things that you really cherish, things that you want to spend your time on, you will find yourself rewarded later on in life. And ironically, that's all it takes. Take your time, and make the upfront sacrifice, and years down the road, you will have the things you desire. And more importantly than that, those things you want will last. So, I've basically smoothed that out. I've rounded this part out which is nice because it means I can fit my thumb over this. I can actually wrap my hand around this. Now there's a little bit more that I'm gonna get off, but I'm gonna use a different file for that. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit this side. As you can see, I got a little bit of um, file rash right here, and that's gonna happen from time to time. You'll accidentally scuff your guitar a little bit. That's part of the territory. You are modifying a guitar. You are gonna scratch it up a bit, and you have to be willing to deal with that. So, you know, gotta live with it, you know? So let's see, which way is this grain going? This grain is going upwards, so I need to go like this. So yeah, um, gotta take your time with things. So I'll talk about some of the other things going on in my life right now. So currently I'm gonna be looking to get a master's degree in special education. Um, I'm not entirely sure exactly how I feel about it because it is a huge commitment and it is something that is going to pull me away from music and art considerably I am gonna have to spend a lot of time studying you know because that's what it takes to get a master's but um, if I am successful in this endeavor it will give me a lot of long-term stability um, one of the things is that teaching credentials are only local to the state that you get the credential in now granted a California teaching credential is one of the most difficult ones to get and it's generally recognized in most states, but it's not a surefire way to guarantee my future, my stability. So I'm looking to get a master's in special ed and get a credential in visual impairment. So I will be doing a master's in special ed so that I can work basically for the district and uh, get a VI credential to work with the blind and teach blind people how to use um, canes and teach them how to train their seeing eye dogs if they decide to get one and you know things like that so i'm looking forward to that because ultimately um, it's going to offer me health care and a pension and while this isn't my long-term plan you know to be in uh, special ed or vi it is something that will enable me in the interim to get by and to move out of my parents' house and to have a future for myself. Um, I think that that's really important and is arguably more important than just spending all my time focused on music and art. Because while I do love music and art and want to just put everything aside to strictly pursue that, I know that um, having the financial stability to move out of my parents' home and live in the Bay Area with some reasonable accommodation is very important. I don't want to be living in, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area in a van. I want to have my own place. Furthermore, you know, if I'm lucky enough to meet a young woman who'd be interested in spending some time with me, it'd be nice to have my own place to take her back to. That way, you know, even if she has her own place, which, you know, I would hope she would, um, it would seem like I would have my act together, you know. 
that's one of the things that's really important. You know, I knew a lot of people in San Jose who kind of like burnt themselves out, not really having uh, the best priorities. And they kind of like systematically all made the same mistakes. They put pleasure before progress and they um, lacked the discipline necessary to make that upfront sacrifice and they ended up paying for it in the long run because a lot of them are construction workers. And so like, you know, one of the guys I knew who was a drummer and eventually was a singer and was in a heavy metal band down in San Jose and is now living in San Francisco with his girlfriend is struggling considerably. So he's struggling considerably because ultimately um, he doesn't have steady work and when he does work it's as I said in construction which is very physically tiring and exhausting. It's not very sustainable for him because as a musician you work with your hands a lot and as a construction worker you kind of wear out your hands you know because you're always hammering things or working with a jackhammer or any kind of crazy machinery that's heavy you know it's all very physically exhausting on the body and it's not it's not very sustainable in a sense so um, you know he's he's struggling with that I knew a guy who was a really good musician really brilliant musician could do a lot of two-handed um, sweet tapping techniques and um, he was in a really good band and he became a pizza guy and dropped out of college to pursue his band full time. And their singer quit and moved across the country um, several states over to uh, live with his girlfriend because he was uh, in love. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that happened and it, that really screwed over my friend because basically he dropped out of school to pursue his band and the band pretty much broke up when that happened they stopped progressing at least they weren't very um, productive as it was prior to that but even then it was like even less so like to an even greater grinding halt and so the, the idea of progress at any cost is kind of uh, idiotic and not to say that those people are bad people it's just you know they probably didn't make the best decisions with their time and energy and they wanted something so badly they were willing to sacrifice anything for it yet ironically when they thought that they were making a sacrifice by committing you know all of their time to this thing that they loved they were actually bringing themselves further away from it because what they needed to do was the exact opposite and commit more deeply to locking down a steady day job and a fixed source of income that would enable them to have you know a certain amount of freedom in order to pursue their craft and pleasure and so my friend who quit school to become a pizza guy is still working at the pizza shop he doesn't really have a band anymore and he just kind of plays guitar by himself or with one of his buddies every once in a while but it's not a very productive or fulfilling lifestyle for him and I can tell that he kind of regrets his decision, his impulsive decision. It's a very difficult thing to pay the consequences for. So, yes, I'm not really looking forward to having to get a master's. It's going to take me away from everything that I love. I do like special ed and I do like the idea of helping other people. But I do also have personal desires that I wish to fulfill, things that I want to accomplish in my life before I die. And we all die. That's the name of the game. So really, life is about living as much as you can before you die and trying to find fulfillment and purpose in the time you have before you die. So with that said, yes, there are things I would like to do that are way more fulfilling than going back to school. As much as it's a privilege, and I do know that my ability to go back to school as a um, master's student is, is in fact a privilege, while that is a privilege, and I do believe it is a privilege, it is still um, a bit of a burden and a pain in the ass. But, um, you know, that being said, it's something that I got to do. So 
you do what you got to do. But right now, I'm here with you guys, and we're talking guitar. Yeah, that's right, we're talking about guitars. My favorite thing in the world, guitars. That and art. And mono black devotion for Magic the Gathering. I love playing Phyrexian Obliterator on turn four. I lo Actually, this is my favorite thing. All right, my favorite thing. Turn one, Grave Crawler. Turn two, Blood Gas. Turn three, Geralt's Messenger. Or turn three, Phyrexian Arena, depending on which in, is in hand. Turn four, Phyrexian Obliterator. Turn five, Grey Merchant of Ashfordel. You know how much devotion that is? That is, let me think, three, six, if it's Geralt's Messenger, 10, 12. That is 12 devotion on turn five if you played the Geralt's Messenger. And if you played Phyrexian Arena instead, it is 11. That is an 11 point life swing. And that's from every player. If you do that in EDH, you are going to make people cry. 11 times 3 is 33. 11 times, or 12 times 3 is uh, 36. So 33 to 36 point life swing in EDH. God, I love EDH. And yes, it is EDH. Not necessarily Commander, but EDH. I'm old school about things. One of the cards I'm looking forward to getting is Vora Stronghold, so I can recur my creatures better. I'm gonna make a black infect prow or not prowess, um, proliferate. That's the one. Different P. Um, proliferate deck using Yogmothran Physician, and I've got like a bunch of really cool cards. Um, I've got a Skithrelix, the Blight Dragon. I've got a um, Obviously, a Frexian Obliterator. I have a um, Cabal Coffers, a Tomb of Yagmoth, Urborg Tomb of Yagmoth, um, Cabal Stronghold, Frexian Plague Lord, Bitter Blossom, a bunch of other really cool cards like that. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to all that stuff too. And uh, yeah, you know, those will be really fun, fun uh, cards to play. My friend Zach is going to be playing a white blue Hana artifact enchantment sort of control deck. So um, he had a demonic tutor that he pulled out of the um, Modern Masters set, the most recent one, the last one that they ever did. It was Christmas time. I bought everybody a Modern Masters um, pack. It was the um, anniversary one or whatever. It was the most recent one. The one where they reprinted Seismic Assault and Life from the Loam. That sounds like a really fun limited environment. I watched Caleb Gannon. Twice he pulled a Life from the Loam and, and Seismic Assault, which is hilarious. Um, Caleb Gannon's a pretty good YouTuber. Caleb, this is Keenan Fry from the Acid Drip. I constantly complain about your picks, dude. You are you are always playing four color, five color good stuff. Oh my god, my dude, play more consistent builds. So anyway, um, yeah. So they uh, they're all gonna play those kinds of cards. Uh, the um, artifact and enchantment build is uh, Zach and. Yeah, so I was telling you about the, the Modern Masters pack I got him. So I got him one, and he pulled a Foil Containment Priest and a just a regular edition um, Demonic Tutor in the same pack. Man, that is a hell of a Foil pack. So the um, Containment Priest was like 30 bucks, and the Demonic Tutor is like also 30 bucks. It was like a $60 pack. It was like mind-blowing. So I traded him a ton of enchantments over the weekend to get his copy of Demonic Tutor. And... Um, Really proud that I didn't have to spend money out of pocket for that because, you know, that's one of the things. Magic can be very expensive, and I try to limit my expenses t to uh, the game, even though I thoroughly enjoy playing it. That's about the one useless sort of outlet I have for my time is playing Magic. But it's a really nice creative outlet in a sense because I get to play competitively with friends 
if we all talk trash, get a six pack of beers, maybe I'll drink two of them. Everybody else usually drinks one or two as well. And uh, maybe maybe uh, I'll have my Kahlua and cream. I don't do white rations anymore because I don't really like vodka and I try not to drink too much. But I'll have a Kahlua and cream every once in a while when we do Magic Night. And we, we'll do one of those big Magic Nights like once every month maybe. Sometimes, sometimes uh, it takes longer than that. Recently we did a Magic Game Night. It was a draft. And we hadn't done a Magic Game Night in like damn near three months. So it was really fun to finally be able to draft. We did I had a uh, draft of um, War of the Spark, which is really fun. So, um, yeah, I bought a box, and then we all split it. There was like eight of us splitting the box, so it was very affordable. So I put it on the card, and everyone reimbursed me, which was really nice. And we all hung out at my house and played some Magic. Really nice evening. So yeah, I got a demonic tutor. Got to eventually figure out a way to get a vampiric tutor. I also want to get a strip mine and a crucible of worlds because I'm that guy. I'm the guy who likes losing friends. <laughs> strip mine, crucible of the worlds. Yep, that's me. It's like if you've ever watched Magic uh, Goldfish, MTG Goldfish, and then you've ever watched their Commander Clash, it's like Seth, Seth Olive will play a... Um, a very early strip mine and just strip mine people. He was really famous for doing that to Vince, like all the time, like turn one strip mine. And so I, I think that's hilarious because that's exactly what I want to do. But like Seth was nice enough not to run Crucible. I would do that to my friends and then also run Crucible. Just because, you know, I would not only do that, I'd go black green for commander so I could play fast bond. Crucible, fast bond, strip mine. Now that is how you lose friends. And that, my friends, is the full combo. And I would 100% without a hesitation run that. And I, I do have to say this. I do credit Caleb Gannon for, um, you know, initiating my love for strip mine. I never really realized how brutal of a card that was until I got a chance to um, proxy it. I uh, proxied it out at a, another game night with some friends and that card single-handedly won most of my games that night. So yes, Caleb, you are right. Strip Mine does win games. So if you're coming here now and wondering why I'm doing this, still wondering why I'm doing this, it's because I'm completely batshit crazy. I, uh, and I can certify why I'm crazy. It's not because I'm an artist. It's because I'm an artist instead of a biochemical engineer. My father's a biochemical engineer. If I had decided to become a biochemical engineer, then by now I'd already be making six figures, working for a top genetics research and engineering company, firm, whatever you want to call it, laboratory, like my dad does, as his lab assistant. I could totally be doing that right now. And instead, I teach special ed kids, and I play guitar, I paint album covers for death metal bands, and I write books. That's right, I wrote a book, wrote my first book, finished the first draft of my first book got a lot more work to do on the book but it's very close to being ready for second revision I have to type it up I wrote my book on note cards and the reason why I wrote my book on note cards was that if at any point I got an idea later on in the writing process and I wanted to revise something I could just write a note card like I want to do a revision to this section well okay that's note card 152 I could do note card 152A, which is the original one, and then I could insert note card 152B, 
C, D, E, F, G, and continue going in that manner until I completed the idea that I was inserting into the story. So that's kind of my writing process. I also prefer to write it on note cards because I like writing by hand. It's easier for me to get my thoughts down. And I feel like writing on a computer keyboard sometimes, my thoughts get in the way of themselves. And just the format of writing gets in, you know, my way being on a computer. I actually very much prefer paper. There's like this sort of like opalescence to the uh, computer screen that makes me want to reject it. But when I see paper, I'm consumed by a almost irrational urge to cover it from head to toe in marks, even if they're just nonsensical squiggles. Largely because I'm just driven by compulsion to just doodle over any clean piece of paper I find. That goes back to my artistic background. I'm loving to draw and doodle and sketch. As you can see, the neck is starting to take shape. It's getting there. And I'm able to keep my, my work on the neck consistent because I'm doing long strokes. The longer your strokes are, the more consistent they are. The more consistent they are, the more even the shaving is, and the better the overall modification on your guitar. The last thing you want to do is, is decide to make a modification to your guitar, shave off the finish, and then rush this part of the process. Once you've taken the finish off, you know, your ball's deep, you're committed. You have to go all the way with it. So if that's the case, why would you rush that? Take your time, enjoy the ride. Sometimes I'm like really mellow and then other times I'm like an R-rated version of Bob Ross. I can't tell what vibe I'm going for. Do you guys like it when I cuss and say like, slightly rude and cheeky like commentary or would you rather have me keep it squeaky clean i kind of think it's funny when i'm rude and off the cuff but some people just take that stuff way too personally they get offended by that shit personally speaking i have to be very measured at my day job because of the nature of my work so my free time I like to be a little bit more unrestrained. So if I could play any kind of EDH deck, to be perfectly honest with you, it'd probably be a Yidris deck. I like Cascade a lot. I kind of like Anarchy when it comes to um, my card games, mostly because um, the Anarchy makes the format a little less stale. So like Cascade's my favorite example of Anarchy. I would literally just play a um, 100 card deck of just creatures, artifacts, and lands. No real like, need for enchantments or sorceries or instants, just literally creatures and artifacts. So when you cascade, you basically can only hit permanents. There might be a few enchantments I run, but I would be very hesitant about that because it's very easy for enchantments to get blown out. But um, I, at least auras can get blown out very easily. That's very common. But what I would do is just run, you know, Yidris, I'm like anti-white, you know, in terms of uh, my color identity. <laughs> I came out horribly. That's really funny. Um, yeah, I don't like playing white cards. <laughs> I'm anti-white. <laughs> That's not even what I meant, but I can be taken many different ways, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Um, 
so yeah, in terms of my color identity, I'm, I'm anti-white because I don't really like white as a color. I think it's probably the weakest color in Commander. I think that um, I think that red's pretty powerful. I'm actually not impressed with blue, even though I know that like Mono Blue Brawl is probably one of the most competitive EDH decks out there. Um, I'm not really impressed by Mono Blue. Um, granted, now that they printed Urza, I'm kind of like stoked on that. I think Urza is a really cool <sighs> commander. <sighs> I think Urza is like 100% the real deal. Like everybody's hyped him up and it's like, yeah, he really is the commander you're looking for. He dodges Bolt. He dodges most um, quick removal, like Fatal Push and stuff. So I, I, he could... Well, he doesn't, he doesn't dodge a revoked Fatal Push, and if somebody's running re Fatal Push, they're probably going to be able to um, revolt it with um, fetches. So that's, that's highly likely. Um, so, you know, if, if you, don't, you don't run Fatal Push without being able to trigger revolt, is, is the point of what I'm saying. So if, if, if he dies to Fatal Push, you know, he dies to Fatal Push. It doesn't really matter what mode it's on. Um, so he does, he does die relatively easily, but he does dodge bolt at least, um, blocks with relative confidence and consistency. And yeah, he's just an all around, very effective combo enabler. So yeah, I really like Urza. I really like the new Plague Engineer. I think Plague Engineer is a really good card for hosing the crap out of tribal decks. Um, get a little bit more of that finish off on the edge. That's the other thing is when you're shaving the neck like this, eventually you run into a point where you start um, working on um, shaving down towards the uh, fretboard like I am right now. And you're going to scratch the side of the wood on the fretboard. It's inevitable. Got to be willing to deal with that. You'll polish it out with your, you know, 2000 grit wet sanding paper. And then I've got 5000 grit um, steel wool that I'll further buff it with. So. It really doesn't matter that I scratch it because I'm going to work all of that out. Really what I want to do is just make sure that my lines are very clean. That I try and get as much of this finish off as possible. And that I really make this look like I did a fairly uniform job. That's kind of the goal. So anyway, I like Yidris because the Cascade kind of makes things fun. Like, imagine if you cascaded into a Maelstorm Wanderer and then Maelstorm Wanderer, you know, cascaded into Bloodbraid Elf, into something else, you know. It's like, I, I love that. You know, I, I love playing that kind of deck, you know. I love the chaos that it inspires. So as you can see, I'm trying to, again, go long ways, but I am doing like little bits where I go like that, or I might go like that. And I'm just trying to get the glue. There's glue that's holding this fretboard down onto the neck. I'm trying to get that off so I can get it smooth. The glue will come off, but you kind of have to like work around it a little bit. Again, you're gonna scratch the edge of the fretboard. You gotta be okay with that. You are shaving a neck after all. You are going to have to deal with the fact that you are shaving a guitar neck. Keep calm, cool, and collected. I want to take a little bit more off of here. So I'm going to just go like that. If you want to take a little bit more off, you can. Just maybe work, you work it a little bit. So 
So here I'm kind of sculpting out this higher part. I'm just making it a little bit easier for me to get my hand up there. One of the things I'm looking forward to doing with my new Mono Black EDH deck, I'm going to get a Volrath Stronghold, and I'm going to make a SAC engine, and then um, part of that SAC engine will be <laughs> Reoccurring Nightmare. So that's another card that I want to get. I'm looking to slowly invest in a few of the um, Reserve Lifts cards because I know that if I pick them up, I can gradually build a more tier version of the deck i don't really plan on going super competitive but like i definitely love curb stomping my friends it's like my favorite thing in the world is to just smash it in my friend's face when it comes to like you know playing moto black in fact in commander because basically everyone's starting at like 25 percent life um and I, I totally am willing to accept like any hate anyone is willing to throw my way for playing Infect in EDH. I know you have to be a sadistic son of a bitch to play Infect in EDH. And I am like more than happy to accept that, um, that label. <laughs> That's part of the reason why I'm running it. It's like I kind of want the hate. So like I said, Skith Relix is one of my plans, but I'm gonna use Icarats to pretty much guarantee that everyone gets a poison counter. And then I'm just gonna proliferate the crap out of them and like run them in the ground. Really the deck is just built around getting a poison counter on a few people and then wiping them out with, you know, uh, Seed of Geth, or, or sorry, not Seed, Throne of Geth and um, various other proliferate engines. Uh, I've got a Contagion class. I do not use Contagion Engine. I think Contagion Engine is kind of a do-nothing card. However, I do like the class because it's significantly cheaper to play and you can do other things with it. Um, and you can, uh, you know, use it in many different ways. I'm going to use a uh, Liliana from one of the um, modern, or what is it, one of the core sets, the one uh, Dark Realms, Liliana of Dark Realms, to fetch out my swamps. And then that's how I'm going to power up my um, Urborg to move. Or not my, I'm going to use the swamps and I'm going to use Expedition Map to search up Urborg or search up. Um, Cabal, uh, Cabal Coffers or Cabal Stronghold. Um, if I was playing, I think my favorite three color combination of EDH, if I was playing that, it would be Sultai. Um, if I could, I would, with without question of doubt, play um, Leovold. I, I love Leovold. I'm that guy. I'm that guy that everybody hates sits down at Commander and it's like, I'm the only one that's gonna have fun, I'm the only one here who's gonna play Magic. I love Degenerate Magic. Like I said, I love Strip Mine and Crucible of Worlds. I love Strip Mine, Fastball and Crucible of Worlds. You know, I love that. I love me some Degenerate Jank bullshit. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know. Yogg Will in the Lion's Eye Diamond in the Black Lotus into Tendrils of Corruption for a million. I'm actually not much of a Storm player. I think Storm is not fun. I, um, I like playing creature-based builds because it allows me to play with my opponent. Like, I kind of like using my deck to like kind of lock them out of the game. And then I um, 
purposely let them come back a little bit. Like I let them land a few cards that they would think would get countered or destroyed immediately and let them think that they're coming back and then just kill them the second they have an ounce of hope. Largely because it's for my own entertainment. I'm pretty evil like that when it comes to playing Magic. Largely because I just think it's funny. I like screwing with people. That's that's the the moral of the story. When you play Magic with Keenan, you understand that uh, in an unspoken manner, you are going to be yanked around. That's my favorite kind of Magic. Long, drawn out, yank, jank games. That's why I'm no good for competitive EDH because like, while I want to be competitive when I play, like realistically the reason why I'm competitive is I like messing with people. Not necessarily because I just want to stomp somebody and move on to the next game. I, I like really fun, dramatic games. So I'm not like a totally unfun EDH player. I just, I, I delight in your misery and sorrow. So I invite you, if you ever want to play EDH with me or Commander or Modern, to, to try and cause me as much suffering as possible too. That's kind of like the unspoken social contract. That's now obviously spoken. Is when you play EDH with Keenan, you try to cause as much suffering as you can. The person who makes their opponent the most miserable is the real winner, regardless of the outcome of the game. So the reason why I'm working on this side is because like I told you earlier, I scratched it a little bit. So I'm trying to smooth out that scratch. So I'm working it out a little bit. I'm slowly working the scratch out and I'm evening it out a little bit. Again, I'm not gonna sell this guitar. So I don't really care what anybody else thinks or says about it. I just want it to be what I want it to be. And I'm okay if it's a little scuffed. I believe that life has dents. And the sooner you come to accept and learn that, the happier you will be. So I uh, try to embody that in my own day-to-day -day life. I think that's the, the thing that's going to get me through everything. You know, this master's program in the next few years, moving out on my own and dealing with just the general expenses and bullshit of life is the fact that uh, I take my time and I do things for myself that I enjoy and I don't really care about what other people think too much. I like people thinking that I'm reliable and that they can count on me. I definitely care about that part of my reputation in terms of whether people um, like me as a as person or like my decisions or, or maybe more or less approve of my decision that, that's something that's irrelevant to me I don't really care about your approval I just care about you know being able to live my life so yeah I'm shaving basically a $800 guitar but new this guitar is like Closer to 1600 That's because Gibson's overpriced. This guitar should really be like no more than $1,000. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm shaving it down and, and messing with it. I know somebody's going to be upset about that, and I don't really care. I just am doing my do. Slowly working this out, getting it smoothed out. So I am kind of going against the grain a little bit because I'm trying to smooth out this edge and get the finish like a little bit more round. So it's a little bit more acceptable. I 
think one of the things I've learned in life is don't worry about what other people think. I think that's the entire point of what I'm trying to say. If you worry too much about what other people think about you, you won't get anywhere. You want people to think that you're reliable and to have people think that they can trust you and, you know, believe your word when you give them your word so that people aren't disappointed in you. But at the same time, if you try to always live up to their standards, you're going to ultimately serve them and fail yourself. I can't really think of a tragedy worse than that. Which is why I'm not a biochemical engineer and I'm not really a special ed teacher. I'm a death metal guitarist who happens to write books and make album covers for other death metal bands while also happening to pay the rent, day bills, and various other uh, expenses by being a special ed teacher. So um, I'd say we're pretty good on the 60 grit. I'd say we're actually really good on it. Um, this is very smooth. It feels good in my hand. It's a little bit more shaved down here than up here, but again, that helps for this part of the uh, neck socket. It makes it a little bit more scooped. I can get my hand around it a little bit better. It's a little bit easier for me to get my thumb around this now. My hand on there. If I take my hand and open my hand up, it's a little bit easier to squeeze this. So I definitely like this now a lot more than I did before. But uh, we're going to keep going. And uh, got a little bit more finish to take off. And then we're going to switch to um, maybe a little bit more work with the file. And then go back to the 60 grit and then a little bit more with the file. And go back and forth until I feel like the neck's where it needs to be. I can definitely take a little bit more off of this. We've just started, and there's plenty of light out. That's the thing I love about summer. Don't get me wrong, I hate the 103 weather during the day. That just drives me nuts, but the afternoons are my absolute favorite time. This is my favorite time of year. This is my favorite time of day. I've got a nice Italian soda right here that I get to enjoy. Life is good. And look, there's no wood fiber in this one. Blood orange. Ah, <coughs> oh, that's how you know it's good. I want to take more of this off. Yeah, a little bit more. A little bit. Well, you know what, if I shave it anymore, I'm going to run into another problem. So that's the other thing, is knowing when um, you need to move on to another grit. Um, I do want to shave this some more, but here's the other thing. As I shave this, I'll still be taking some amount of material off as I go into the higher grit. I'll be taking less material off as I go into those higher grits, and it'll be more about polishing and, and sculpting than necessarily the removal of material. But the value in that is um, gradually some amount of material will, will come off, especially while I'm like under 150, you know, going into the 300 grit range. Under 150, I still will be taking a lot of material off. So it's okay to like kind of undershave with the file and let the rest of the work emerge from the sandpaper kind of hard to know when to stop because it's really easy once you get going to just keep going you want to just go until the end you know that's it's a very hard thing to know you never really do know for certain you just kind of guess and you just give it your best so let me just smooth this out and then we're going to move to a higher grit
one of the other things you want to do is you want to try and get the finish as even as possible. You want to try and get a straight line where you remove the finish. So that way when you move on to the next grit, you can focus more on keeping the line even than on trying to establish the line. So like right now with my 60 grit, I'm really trying to establish the center line of the neck. And there's only one way to do that, and that's to really dig in. And notice I'm really using my elbow for this. Like I'm really going from the elbow. Let me see if I can adjust this so you can see what I'm talking about. So like this part's important so you can see how I'm working my guitar. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to move the camera a little bit. This is kind of how I'm working it now. Yeah, and long strokes, but I'm going along this line. Right here it's really clean, but here there's a little bit of orange, and that's left over of the finish that I'm trying to remove. So I want it to be as close as possible to a straight line. It won't ever really be a perfectly straight line, but I can get it close to it. So part of my sack engine is going to be um, Micaeus the Unhollowed and a um, Grave Crawler because, uh, and a uh, Geralt's Messenger, something like that. You know, basically sacrifice something to Yagmoth, dies, get a minus one, minus one counter, put it on, I don't know, Micaeus or something. Geralt's Messenger comes back. Sacrifice another creature like Gravecrawler. Put the counter on Gerald's messenger. Messenger comes back. And uh, they lose two life. And you keep going along that cycle until you kill one of your play opponents. So yeah, that's another card I ordered was Micaeus. I'll eventually put in a Kukusho and a shield a Shieldred and um, Massacre Worm. I don't think Grizzlebrand is legal in EDH, but I'll still buy a copy of him just because I love having strong black cards. Again, I'm anti-white. <laughs> I, mean, I really don't think white's a good color in uh, EDH or just in general. I think that Thalia is probably one of the best white cards. That and Swords to Plowshares. Mother of Ruin's a pain in the butt, but White's very good at disrupting things, but I think black is even better at being disruptive and has just, in general, better threats and, and spells to play than white. You know, Swords to Plowshares is a really good answer, but, you know, Yog Will is, like, not something that white is actually prepared or capable of answering. You know, Yog Moth's Will or Yog Moth's Bargain or, you know, any of those sort of cards and effects. You see this here, I'm now cleaning up this edge.
you know, I was thinking about pre-ordering a Modern Horizons box. One of those things that I, I really wanted to do because I thought it would be fun to draft that with my friends. But I decided, you know, a better use of my time and money would be to put it towards projects. So I ordered a few cards that I wanted to pull from that set. Um, I pre-ordered them. And then I took the rest of the money and I set it aside. You know, so instead of spending all that money on cards, I'm trying to be financially conservative. But at the same time, I'm also, you know, allowing myself to spend a little bit of money on something that's kind of wasteful and self-indulgent. But, um, you know, I, I do that a little bit too. You know. I think that a lot of people try to preach that there's some kind of savior saint, but like I'm totally flawed like everyone else. So if you've got some kind of outlet that's like a vice, a quote vice, and like as long as it isn't, you know, alcoholism or something like that, if you got something that, you know, you maybe squander a little bit too much of your money on, but it's not like too, too bad, that's okay because in the end we're all human and it's kind of about enjoying the time that you get to spend on this earth spending it on things you enjoy so you know the guilty pleasures are kind of necessary in life they help us get by they help us enjoy things more it makes life worth living the guilty pleasures make the tough times worthwhile so you know whatever your guilty pleasure is I hope you enjoy it within a certain modicum of moderation. Plus, to be honest with you, I like buying singles more than drafting in the end because it, it got me into the EDH format because there were some staples I was missing. I bought a Cabal Coffers. You know, I wouldn't be able to pull that from Modern Horizons, that's for sure. And, you know, being able to have a Cabal Coffer, it really makes a black EDH deck. Furthermore, you know, I, I may not even get a Yagma from a Modern Horizons box, but I know I'm going to get one if I pre-order him. So that money's better spent, more conservative spent. Not going to lie, it's really fun opening packs, but there's better ways to spend money than just opening packs. Plus, I did plenty of that when War of the Spark came out. We did a whole box draft. We also drafted um, Dominaria, and we drafted Almond Cat. We did not draft Ixlon. I did not really like Ixlon. I didn't think Ixlon was very good. I thought it was interesting. I liked a lot of the flip cards, but I didn't think it was a very good set in the end. Although I do like the idea of maybe one day playing Kumena EDH or something like that. I do like Kumena a lot. I think he's a cool card. I remember when Kumena came out, everybody was like, oh my God, this card is insane. And they were charging like $30 for it. Now it's out, and there's not even a standard deck for him, so he's just bulk rare. Even though he's a very good commander card, and we'll probably eventually have like a falling in archetype. That's probably one of the things I don't like about Magic, is like, you opt out of buying some cards because it's very expensive, and then you kind of get punished later on for that because... It's a very expensive hobby, to say the least. So, we're going to move on from the 80 grit, and we are going to move on to the 120. So, yeah, time to bump up. Actually, wait, I have, I think, some 100 in here. Let me see if I got 100. Yeah, I got 100 right here. That's the cool thing about sandpaper. It never goes bad. You know, if, you, if you're creative and you like working with wood, you know, sandpaper is always a great investment. And like, 
you know, if you have a significant other, somebody who's watching this who maybe isn't a craftsman themselves but knows somebody who is, um, if you know somebody who plays guitar and might want to do a project like this, getting them a bunch of sandpaper like this is a great gift because sandpaper never goes bad. They can use it for many, many things besides just, you know, working on a guitar project. And it's always just fun to work with. It's always fun to work with sandpaper. I love sandpaper. It's like one of my favorite things. It's very, it's very meditative, I think, because you kind of just zone out. You're trying to do these really long strokes. doing long, slow strokes. Yes. yes. Like Frank Zappa would say, stroke it. <laughs> That's my innuendos and so forth, but I love Frank Zappa. He did um, St. Alfonso. One of my favorite Zappa albums of all time. Of course, besides the, you know, shut up and play your guitar. One of my other favorite albums is um, Apostrophe. I really love Apostrophe. That's probably, in my opinion, the best Frank Zappa record as like a comprehensive idea. It's witty and funny, and it's also like very musically talented and brilliant. Like songs like Uncle Remus and so forth, just, you know, really good songs. Apostrophe, the Namesake song, namesake song itself is an incredible solo um, with uh, Eric something from, um, it's Eric, it's not, no, it's not Eric. Um, Eric Clapton is the guitarist from Cream. It's the, it's the um, bass player from Cream whose name is escaping me. I'll have to YouTube him, or not YouTube him, but um, Wikipedia him. Um, Eric Burden? Yeah, it's Eric, Eric Burden. Yeah, it is, yeah, there's two Eric's in Cream, I think. There's Eric Clapton and there's Eric Burden. But the, the bass player from Cream is on that song and like, holy crap, he has an amazing tone. Like, listening to him play the bass on that song makes me want to go out and buy a bass just to learn how to play like his part on that song. And maybe just like in general learn to play the bass and you know i think it's actually a very valid undertaking if you want to be a better musician to learn um bass because it it makes you more knowledgeable of the melody and rhythm and it makes you just a more versatile musician you know when you understand the bass part and the rhythm part and the lead part it's pretty phenomenal when you can do all of that so yeah you know, if you can learn bass, go for it. I think I'll eventually pick up um, an OLP Stingray. So an L OLP is officially licensed product. And a um, there's literally a company called OLP. And they make basically officially licensed versions of more famous instruments. So there's an OLP Stingray bass. It's literally the same thing as a Stingray um, that Fender makes. But... Well, not literally, it's as close to being literally the same thing as a Stingray bass um, that they can achieve, but without the, um, the Fender name. So, it's as close to a literal copy as you can get. Um, and they're significantly cheaper. It's like a real Stingray can cost you two grand, and an OLP Stingray will cost you 500 bucks. And, you know, that's another really good starter instrument that's like of exceptional craftsmanship that I would highly recommend to anybody considering starting off in music or know somebody who is going to start off in music. Get like an OLP, whether it's a guitar or a bass, you'll, you won't, you won't go wrong with it. And it's literally OLP, officially licensed product is the brand. It does say OLP on the headstock. It's not exactly the most attractive headstock sort of logo. A lot of people are really pretentious about, you know, having a beautiful guitar and having a really beautiful, you know, brand name, you know. That's why a lot of people will 
like refuse to buy an Epiphone, even though in many cases, like Epiphone was actually better than Gibson, um, just because they want the name Gibson on their guitar. <sighs> I'm not going to lie. I'm a huge Gibson head myself. Obviously, I've got a Fender Mustang that I built. That was the first guitar that I ever built. But I am a huge Gibson fan, and um, that's because of Mastodon. Both the guys in Mastodon, Brent and Bill Kelleher, are Gibson guys. And it was literally because Brent Hine played a flying Silverburst V, and Bill basically played Explorers that made me decide, you know what, I'm going to go out of my way and buy an Explorer and a flying V. And, you know, I, I bought the Mustang, I'm not going to lie, partly because of Kurt Cobain and partly because I wanted a bolt-on neck guitar that was not a Strat. And I thought Jaguars and um, Jazzmasters were kind of ugly, to be honest with you. I still think they're kind of ugly. They got way too many switches on them. I, I'm definitely a fan of less is more. It's the whole, like, rock climbers mindset. Like, the more gear you carry the more weight it is you're bearing. So for me personally, I think less is more. When I build that guitar over there, out of this body, it's gonna be one humbucker, one volume, that's it. Nothing else. I might install a kill switch, but um, that's a big if. And there's a ton of holes in there. It was originally routed to have a bunch of control switches and I'm just gonna leave them empty because um, I don't really care. And uh, you know, I believe less is more. Having fewer knobs and doodads on your guitar is probably for the better. Um, but when it comes to effects, like running an effects rig, yeah, I'm totally in favor of going all out. But I think your guitar itself should be Less is more. I think the more pure your tone is out of your instrument, the better you're going to sound when you do finally decide to run guitar through a bunch of effects. It'll just come out way better, way more soulful. So now I'm at the point where like the grain is actually starting to become more uniform because the uh, 100 grit that I'm working with is really taking the edge off of the 80 grit and the 80 grit definitely took the edge off of the uh, file <laughs> the crazy like metal file like <laughs> so yeah I mean I'm probably gonna finish this in one sitting you know so you know I've been recording for an hour and a half that includes breaks between the videos. I haven't actually gotten up from the workbench. I've just reset the camera. So there's a few breaks in, in this video where, you know, the camera times out. So I have to reset it so that I don't just, you know, cut off in the middle of my thought. But for the most part, you know, I've just been here for an hour and a half. You know, and I'll probably finish this in maybe a little bit more than two hours in terms of the sanding. The next video, I'll show you how to finish it because we are going to seal this. I'm not going to just, you know, sand this down and then leave it unprotected. You know, that would be really foolish. So that's the other thing is like you have to have a lot of uh, supplies to do this. We're going to seal this up with gunstock oil. And uh, gunstock oil is basically linseed oil. And uh, obviously it's commonly used for gun stocks like walnut, maple gun stocks, cherry gun stocks. Um, a lot of custom gunsmiths will make really nice decorative gun stocks. And uh, they use gun stock oil, which is basically linseed oil. And it's, um, it's a very good uh, way to seal your instrument. It saturates the wood, soaks into the wood, and it gives it this oily residue and it resists other oils and it resists moisture because obviously oil and water don't mix. Um, oils can get absorbed by it but it's a very thick kind of resiny sort of material so it's it's very hard for other oils to get into it. If you clean it regularly it's not a problem. It's actually a very reasonable way to finish a guitar very cheaply. A big old bottle of the stuff is maybe gonna cost you 20 bucks. You can get it online. 
Um, generally, it comes from Canada. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff. So yeah, I like working with linseed. I'd highly recommend that before anything else. Um, I have worked with spray lacquer. It is um, an effective way as well, but again, it's a quick sort of dirty solution. I don't recommend it unless you absolutely have to use it. I recommend um, using uh, regular paint-on lacquer if you have the option because it um, takes longer to settle, but it looks nicer. The reason why I've used spray lacquer is not actually on my guitar, but on this pit guard. This pit guard right here has layers and layers of hard spray on lacquer. And the reason for that is that lacquer is a binder and it's a very hard, strong binder. And that pit guard is made out of fiberglass. Um, or not fiberglass, carbon fiber, what am I saying? Um, carbon fiber, and the layers of carbon fiber will separate sometimes. So when you seal it with lacquer, it seeps into there and it seals it shut and it made this like a thousand times harder and now it'll never break. I mean, it could possibly crack if I dropped it on its face and I'd be heartbroken if that happened, but the lacquer definitely did a lot to protect it. And then because I painted on it, the lacquer protects the paint. So lacquer is, is good for, you know, that kind of stuff. But if you're gonna, a spray lacquer is good for that kind of stuff. But if you're gonna try and seal wood, like we are today, and well, probably tomorrow, we're gonna start sealing it. Today, we're gonna just sand. But if you're gonna work on sealing wood, well then, you should probably use regular old wet lacquer. And that stuff is very difficult to work with. You have to have a flat surface. It has to be left out in a certain manner because it is a self-leveling um, material. So it takes a very long time for it to seal and dry evenly. You gotta put a lot of layers on. It's a very time consuming process. And you gotta be willing to, to work with that. If you're not willing to work with it, you know, then I recommend gun stock, also known as linseed oil, which is what we are going to use because it's very practical. Now the other reason why we're going to do the oil probably tomorrow is logistically speaking it takes about six hours for a layer of oil that has saturated the guitar to dry and seal. So if you put on a layer of gun stock oil in the morning and it's 100 degrees out, it'll sure as shit cure in six hours, which means if you put it out at 10 in the morning and you paint your layer on and you leave and you go about your day by about, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, you can put another layer on, maybe, you know, six o'clock, depending on, you know, what it is you're doing. But yeah, about six o'clock you could do it and um, it'll seal. And then what you can do is the next day, put another one in on the morning because overnight it's colder, so it'll take longer for it to saturate. But because it's oil, any moisture that appears overnight, because during the summer, it's very humid, so moisture comes out. Um, any moisture will not land on the wood and ruin it. So you'll be able to, you know, seal it. And then again, work with it the next morning and it will you know be able to be left out overnight and it won't get ruined and you can go along that process for a very long time very effectively to get the uh, results you are looking for uh, so right now I've just done the 60 and it feels excellent with just the 60 on there I mean I am surprised by how smooth this is that's one of the things I like about mahogany is it's very easy to work with because it's loosely packed. Um, so because it's loosely packed, it's very easy to um, sand down. Harder grains like maple um, or ironwood or whatever um, are very, very dense. And so it takes a lot of work to... Uh... So I missed the last 10 minutes. Um, I'm gonna listen to that tape and uh, start over with that part. So I've now worked on it with the um, the 100 grit and uh, it's pretty smooth and now I'm going to move on to the 120 
and then eventually the 150. And we're just gonna keep on moseying up until we get through it. So here is my 120. I have not opened it. Here we go. Whoops. So um, for those of you who uh, might be confused by what just happened, I, um, I have a timer here and it's supposed to be um, keeping track of when I need to reset my um, clock. And the problem is that I uh, <laughs> missed resetting it. So uh, there's gonna be a section that you just saw that's all um, audio, me talking and just, you know, ranting and so forth. And there's probably not gonna be any video to it. And to be quite frank, I'm not gonna go back and re-record it because that's kind of a waste of my time. So um, sorry if that part's a little unprofessional. This is kind of like me trying to focus on doing a good job of sanding while talking to the camera and trying to engage with you, the viewer. And uh, because I'm trying to engage with you and also talk at the same time and work on shaving this and pay attention to w the work I'm doing here because I'm trying to do all that at once. Uh, I missed my timer and that's my fault, my mistake. Um, so sorry about that. There would just be a section of this movie which has no um, video. But this part and henceforth I'll make sure that it uh, resets properly. That's another thing is I eventually need to save up for a better camera that won't time out on me after 20 minutes. I also need to get a new computer. I know that I just kind of ranted about how I bought magic cards and have spent some money on that recently, but um, I do need to save up and buy the parts to build a new, stronger computer because the one I currently have isn't very good and obviously need a better camera so that what just happened doesn't keep happening. And um, that's all stuff that I'm gonna work on down the line to uh, achieve. It's still a bit of a ways away from me. Sorry if I just bumped the mic a little bit. I'm holding this very close to me so I can you know, pay attention to the edge. Really trying to get this nice and smooth. Also, it's getting a lot darker and I'm probably gonna have to uh, change the settings on my camera. And I will probably take a short break to get a light out from my room so I can you know, work in the dark. But yeah, I need to save up for more equipment and supplies. Oh, you know somebody else that I admire? 
I really admire Simon the Magpie. That guy is awesome. He basically does custom builds of um, circuit bent pedals. And it's going to be my goal to get into contact with him more deliberately. I've contacted him once before, and I sent him a poster, the Wind Breath poster that I made back in 17. I um, sent him that, but I want to um, more deliberately contact him. Or actually, it might have been 18 when I printed that. But um, I want to more deliberately contact him and send him um, a pedal for him to circuit bend. And also possibly like modify a guitar for him. Like if he sent me a guitar, I would 100% modify it for him. However it is he has. Like if he wanted me to shave part of it down or whatever, or decorate it in some sort of manner, I would totally be down to do that. So I'm going to move my arm this way, but I'm still going with the grain. I just rotated the guitar, you know. That's the other thing. Don't feel confined to one work orientation. You know, move, move around as you see fit. Be comfortable. The whole reason why you would do an, a project like this is because you want to make your guitar more comfortable. So why not be more comfortable while you also work? Like the whole thing is you're modifying this to make it fit better into your hands, you know. You may as well be comfortable while you're doing this. You see how I drag my thing all the way around it? Kind of hook my finger around the sandpaper so it wraps around the uh, grit. And I just take it all the way up. And then just go nice and smooth. And again, it looks good and neat and feels good and feels like a neat line because I've taken my time again. The longer you take with this process, the better the results. And it's not a huge dramatic cut I'm making. I'm making a very subtle one. What's going to happen though is as I intensify the grits, as I go deeper and deeper into the grits, more will get taken off, more will get polished, and then it will feel better. So that was the 120. As you go up in grit, it gets faster to work the paper because you're doing more polishing. You're moving less of the material and you're doing a lot more polishing. Which one is this? This is also 150. Um, this is a good size piece. Again, sandpaper is always a good gift for any kind of significant other who is on the creative side. Um, it never goes bad. This was a little square that I taped back onto the original piece because I guess I didn't use it the last time I was using the sandpaper. Also, I have these guys, these are sanding sponges. And what is it? This is, yeah, like 220, and this is also like 220. So these are my sanding blocks, and I'm gonna use these towards the end to really try and like smooth out 
the finish. This is these sponges are going to do a lot to really polish this. And when I mean polish, I mean like really smooth out any leftover glue or finish that I didn't quite get off with the sandpaper itself. You get all that off with the sanding sponge. The sanding sponge is awesome because it um, will warp to fit the neck. So I can wrap it around the neck and really like push into the wood and the sponge will conform to the shape of the neck and it will shape itself to the neck while also removing some of the harder to reach material. Again, take the longest possible stroke you can possibly manage. You're going slow with this. You are going the long, slow route. Take your time, we'll get there. This isn't a race. Taste makes waste. Slow and steady. So I'm going to pause this and I'm going to change my settings real quick. So I should be at 3200 and I haven't noticed a significant increase in the light, but I guess that should help for now. If I need to get out a standing light, I will do so. In fact, after I finish using this grant, I will get out a standing light. So there's some scratches in the finish, and I'm going to buffer those out later on. But for now, I'm not going to worry about them. I'm just going to keep focusing on getting this as smooth as possible. Any scratches, I will address later on with the higher grits. Again, you buff with the higher grits, but these lower ones, it's really about polishing the crap out of it. That's one of the things I don't like about Gibson is like this, whew, almost dropped it. Uh, this piece that's right here on the uh, headstock is plastic, which is kind of cheap. You know, I don't like the fact that they do that, that it's plastic. You know, I've heard stories about them using fake inlay, fake mother of pearl for their inlay. That's why you have to spend over a certain amount to really know that you're getting a quality guitar roughly a thousand dollars for um, the original guitar or more is a really good indication and then you know you find a guitar you would want to buy brand new and then you just find an aftermark version of it and generally you can find a used aftermarket every once in a while you'll get a specialty one off that you won't be able to buy an aftermarket of but that's not often the case One of the things I said earlier about Epiphone, um, people sometimes hate on Epiphone because of the brand name. It's not as esteemed as it owning a Gibson, right? Which is kind of pretentious. But then again, you know, I own only Gibson and custom built a sort of Fender clone. But uh, yeah, so I would highly recommend any kind of Epiphone guitar. Um, one of my favorite guitarists, again, Brent Hines, the guy who made me want to buy Gibson in the first place, had his custom model built with Epiphone, and it was his custom Flying V. He had it built with them because he wanted to make the cost of the guitar significantly cheaper 
to make it more approachable to the fan base. So getting that custom Flying V built by Gibson um, and sold to the public through Gibson would have made it at least a $3,000 guitar, but having done it through Epiphone, he could justify selling it for $700 on the street, which is very reasonable for an exceptionally beautiful and well-built guitar. The uh, Epiphone Silverburst Flying V Brent Hines Custom Edition is the real fucking deal. It is probably the most beautiful guitar I've ever seen in my life. It is almost 100% authentic, with the one exception being that instead on the headstock of saying Gibson, it says Epiphone. But the craftsmanship is absolutely immaculate. The tone is phenomenal. It uses the hammer claw humbuckers, which are the ones that he normally uses. He's got custom made hammer claws um, made by Lace Sensor Pickups. Um, Matt Pike also uses Lace Sensor Pickups. Um, Matt Pike from High on Fire. Matt Pike just recently won a Grammy for um, Electric Wizard. Anyway, um, yeah, so the Cubs custom built um, Flying V, phenomenal instrument. I'm actually curious to see if um, Matt Pike will ever actually get a custom built instrument, like if a shop will come up to him and say, you know, we want to build you a serialized model. He has his custom nine string crazy first act sort of guitar, and he's got like a couple of other ones that are also like really unique, but he doesn't actually have like an actual signature series guitar, which is pretty funny because he won a Grammy. He's pretty, you know, infamous, and yet he doesn't have a custom guitar. I'd be surprised if that goes on any longer. I think there are a lot of people who would like jump out of their seats to sign a deal with him. And he could sign a deal with anybody he wants. Lemmy is the motherfucking shit. He is, he is the real deal. Let me, let me tell you about, about Matt Pike. He is the real deal. He is the reincarnation of Lemmy. Let me kill Miser. Okay, that's a little bit of a rough spot right there. I gotta polish that up. That's better. If I pull out a light, I'm probably going to get swarmed by insects. I can't tell if I'm being swarmed as it is right now. There's probably like mosquitoes out here biting me. I can't even tell. Because I can't see shit. Probably need to go inside, grab some bug spray and come back in in just a minute. So we're at the two hour mark. I'm probably going to take a brief break and uh, come back. So, uh, you know, thank you for your time. I will be back momentarily, and we will continue doing this tonight. I'm going to try and get through all of my grits tonight. So I'm going to get a light so you can actually see what the hell I'm doing, because right now it's, like, way too dark. I don't like cranking the ISO too much because it makes the image quality um, not exactly high res. You know, bumping past 3200 is, generally speaking, not a good idea. 6400 is usually where I set the cutoff. I don't like going higher than 6400. You're just going to put a bunch of artifacts and pixely bullshit into the image. So, but this is pretty good. Still some rough spots. Let me, let me grind on this a little bit more.
That's not bad. That's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. All right, I am gonna go inside. Thanks for watching. I'll be back in just a moment. Love summertime. It's that time of year. I got my 180 grit sanding block, and we're gonna get started on this guy. Yeah, that's really nice. If I push it into the wood, it conforms to it very nicely. I can kind of like wrap it around the wood to really taper out my, my work. Yeah, this is going to be really nice by the time it's done. That was probably the smoothest stroke I've done all night. Gotta just keep stroking it. <laughs> Innuendos are implied. Or intentionally implied. <laughs> That's how Frank Zappa was, always with the innuendos. I loved Frank. I think he'd be really disappointed um, today. Frank Zappa would be disappointed in his family um, because his kids are trying to sort of horror out his image. They want to do a three dimensional projection of Frank Zappa. And the fact of the matter is, I think that was something he was firmly against. He, uh, in one of his last interviews before he died, while he was in his basement in L.A., kind of chilling out, I think he had already gotten the cancer diagnosis, and he just wasn't public about it. But um, he uh, was talking about, talking very critically about three-dimensional um, hyper-reality, sort of fake reality, three-dimensional augmented reality and he was critical of it because he was saying how it would try and be seen as a substitute for the actual reality but they would be it would be people who were liars charlatans as he called them um, selling a delusion to a bunch of poor suckers who wouldn't know any better that they were being you know ripped off and lied to and that was Frank's sort of opinion Frank's very frank opinion <laughs> about you know 3d and i don't i don't blame him for thinking like that i think what history has shown us is a little bit different from that the outcome that is but ultimately a very similar sort of situation where um you have a lot of relatively ignorant people being taken advantage of by um unscrupulous sort of businessmen and um Frank was always against that. I don't think Frank really respected the consumer on most levels. I think he kind of disdained consumers. Um, I don't know what his exact official opinion was of his fans. I think he probably thought they had like some amount of intelligence because they liked his work and he was a little bit arrogant and pretentious and I know that he thought he was a genius. So thereby if you listen to his music you're probably smarter than the average Joe. That's probably a fairly reasonable assertion. Um, I also know that Frank Zappa was kind of selfish and didn't really work too well with some of his former band members. He really tried to reinvent himself when he left the Mothers of Invention and started the Frank Zappa band as like the sort of brain behind the operations. But in, you know, the Mothers of Invention, it was very much a group effort. And I know that because I watched a couple of Frank Zappa documentaries. I've read two Frank Zappa biographies, one of which I read twice. Um, so I've, I, I know a bit about Zappa, let's just say that. Um, so yeah, Frank was, was an interesting figure. And um, I don't think he always gets the best rap, but I also don't think he always was the best person. I think he's just somebody who's misunderstood. He's this weird his figure in the history of musical entrepreneurship and I really do see him as a musical entrepreneur he was 
really the first professional independent musician in my opinion. You know, he was the first one to really do everything DIY. In a sense, I think he's kind of like the godfather of punk because that's what punk was all about, you know. Can we bootstrap it? Can we do this DIY? And that's what Frank was 100% about. So, you know, can we can we make this work? That's what Barking Pumpkin Records was all about. And yes, that was his record label, Barking Pumpkin. <laughs> he was a weird guy, to say the least. So now we're going to move on to the next sanding block, and this is 220. 220 sanding grid, and we are just going to work this stuff out. We are going to do all of this sanding tonight. We're going to get it 100% prepared for tomorrow. So the trick is that you only do dry sandpaper on wood. You do not wet sand wood. That's like the number one kiss of death. You do not wet sand wood. And <laughs> why is that? Well, wood and water don't go together, period. <laughs> um, but when you seal the wood, which we will eventually be doing with um, linseed oil, as I discussed earlier, when you seal wood, you um, separate the uh, wood fibers from the open environment. That's basically what sealing does to it. And so like what's being exposed to what would be the wet sandpaper is actually not the wood itself, but the um, linseed oil. So basically when you saturate this with linseed oil, what's happening is you're creating such a thick buildup of linseed oil that it completely soaks and saturates the wood so that the wood isn't really coming into contact with the wet sandpaper, it's just the linseed oil. And that's kind of the purpose of the wet sanding is to polish the linseed oil. So you, you dry sandpaper wood and you wet sand the finish to polish the finish, but you don't hit the wood under any circumstance with wet sandpaper. That's the kiss of death. That has always been the kiss of death, will always be the K-O-D, kiss of death. Just work on that for a second. I'm really digging this guy in. Like, you can really feel that I'm digging this guy in. Because I'm really trying to get this part. And there's a bit of a burl, and that's because that's the big divot in the wood, and there's just going to be a burl there. It's just kind of natural. So that's going to happen. Besides, it's not going to be perfect. We're sanding this. It's not going to be perfectly perfect. It's going to be what it's going to be. It's going to come out. It's going to have its own personality. You know, I'm not trying to make it perfect. I'm trying to make it unique. Perfectly unique. That's what I'm trying to do. But not perfectly perfect. Just perfectly unique. Alright, so I think that's enough for that. Now I'm going to do the block against the back. Yeah, probably just dented it. <laughs> that happens. So the secret to doing work at night when you live in a hot area like I do is to keep the light, your light source, away from you. So the light source is a couple feet away from me, but it's a pretty strong light source. And what's going on is the bugs are swarming the light, but they're swarming the light way the hell away from me. You know, the light's a little bit out of arm's reach. It's about 18 inches away from me, from where I am. It's just a few inches out of my reach, you know. But it keeps the bugs away from me, so that they're not flying directly on me. They're flying close to me, but they're not landing on me and, and harassing me. And I'm just focused on my work, and there being bugs, little gnats flying around. They live 24 hours, and then they die. They have no idea of the majesty and wonder that exists in this world. Do not pity them because they live ephemerally, they live eternally in the moment. They enjoy their lives however brief they may be. I 
I would like to enjoy my life, however brief it may be. In comparison to a redwood tree, my life is relatively brief. In comparison to a gnat, my life is aeons. It's all a matter of perspective. But time, the passage of time is inevitable. So no matter what you do, you may as well use it the best as possible. Which means playing guitar, making art, and kicking my friend's ass at Commander with a mono black infect proliferate deck. this up to 180, it's going to be night and day. Oh, yeah, that's sexy. Come on, baby. Yeah, come on, baby, come on. Yeah. That is just sexy. That is so smooth. It's ridiculous. I never thought shaving a neck would be so sexy. Shaving a woman's neck could be so sexy. <laughs> If your girlfriend has to shave her neck and she's still your girlfriend, you obviously love her. <laughs> Which isn't a bad thing, I guess. That's meant to be purely humorous. Please don't take offense to anything I say. Everything I say is off the cuff and meant to be humorous. I'm talking so much I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> Maybe I already am in any trouble and I don't even know it yet. Niche. This niche is really rough still. This niche is rough as hell. Wow, that's really good. Still rough though. Notice how I put my whole body into it. I'm not just using my wrist. I use my whole body so I don't blow out my arm. Use my whole body.
Try to reset the camera. All right. That looks pretty good. And that's about as good as that's going to get. Okay, I'm going to polish this a few more times with the 120. So one of the things I'm learning to do now is I'm playing some Stevie Ray Vaughan and um, I'm trying to learn Rude Mood but I'm also trying to learn some Hendrix like Little Wing and the reason is because I severely lack a background in blues and I know it's something that will really help my ability to improvise and jam is if I really like push myself to learn those um, genres and particularly those artists within those genres because they were you know, really instrumental figureheads in the development of that musical style. And um, by trying to incorporate more of their playing into my work and into what I do in general, it um, makes me a better musician. And I'm really trying to get over a lot of my musical anxiety which is going to require me to step outside of my comfort zone, which ironically is something that's, you know, a potential source of anxiety, stepping out of your comfort zone. But the advantage of doing that is that it relieves a lot of the uh, tension you normally feel. Um, stepping outside of your comfort zone it relieves that tension that you normally feel from being in that environment. And so you get gradually acclimated to it through exposure therapy and sort of overcome those obstacles. So the blues has definitely been a barrier for me. So has um, reading music. So I'm going to learn the blues and then eventually endeavor into teaching myself how to read music. But I'm teaching myself how to do Photoshop this summer in addition to, you know, the stuff I just described and the things I'm currently doing. And, um, doing a Photoshop project where I'm editing all the photos for the graduating class from the uh, Trace program where I work. And, uh, you know, I didn't get paid to do that job. I'm just doing it because on one hand, I know that it will force me to l learn Photoshop very effectively and quickly. And on the other hand, um, I know that it will mean a lot to those people to have photos of their kids and um, I know that by doing this, it kind of puts me in a good position with my boss. And uh, I kind of want to use that as a 
sort of entryway into this um, career as a uh, special ed instructor. So, you know, by helping other people, I'm in many ways helping myself, which is the best kind of work you can do, where you help others and intrinsically you also find a way to make that help towards others serve you. And I know that that can seem a little selfish, but truly it's not. This is more for buffing and so forth. This is also kind of like for buffing. So this one and this one. So these two I will do last, but those are getting done tonight. So now I am going to the 320, and I am ready. So if you follow the back, I started off at 60, 80, went to 100, 120, did do 150. This guy right here was um, 180. So I didn't just go to 150 to 220. I actually did a 180. This is 220, so I actually did an extra step in between here. Now I'm going to 320, and then after 320, I'm going to just skip the 400 grit and just go to um, the bristle, the bristle pad, the um, Scotch Brite. And then after the Scotch Brite, I will be ready to pack all of this up, be done for the night, and tomorrow I will lay on my first coat. Um, yeah. And I'll film that, and you'll see that in the morning. Linseed oil. And that'll be in the next video. So this video will go up, and then you'll see the next one. feels really good in my hands now. This is really close to being finished. One of the things I'm going to actually do probably tomorrow before I put the um, finish on is I, I talked earlier about TSP and I'm going to definitely hit this with some TSP. That's going to get all of the oils that are on my hands out. But also, um, like I told you earlier, mahogany is a very loose, soft grain. And what I've been doing as I've been sanding this with finer and finer grit is I've been creating sawdust and that sawdust is kind of packing itself into the grain of the mahogany. And I'm not going to lie, that's kind of a bad thing because the sawdust isn't really attached to the wood. It's just dust that's kind of packed into the grain. And I can kind of see where the grain is getting packed in, and that's a bad thing. Um, you want to smoothen it out and polish it, but you also don't want to pack in the grain. So in order to fix that, what I'm going to do is hit it with the TSP and really scrub it and when I hit it with the TSP, I have a feeling that a lot of the crap that's in here is going to come out.
and then after I hit it with the TSP, I will be good to hit it with the finish. So I'll probably hit it with the TSP in the morning, wait an hour, and then put the actual finish on. So TSP, really use some elbow grease, scrub it in there, wait an hour, hammer it with the um, linseed oil, and then uh, go ahead and um, put the, um, the next coat on at the end of the day closer to dusk and then let that second coat dry overnight and just you know do two coats a day until it's done the sanding is actually the hardest part that's why you want to do it kind of in one sitting you just want to sit there and and just do it and then when you know that it's done the easy part is just laying on coats because you just come out in the morning you get your paintbrush out you paint on the layer and then you walk away from it and you go about the rest of your day, you do everything else you gotta do, and then you come back out and you do it again at night. It's very simple. All of the hard work is getting done right now. This is pretty much it. Close to being done. really smooth feels really good can definitely tell though that it's packed in it'll feel a little less smooth once I'm done unpacking it this stuff is a little bit rougher but it's also meant more for polishing and really really getting it ready for that finish that first layer of finish The other reason why I like linseed oil is it's thick, and I mean thick. Wherever you put it on, it's going to sink in. It works really well with lacquer because it melts into whatever um, porous surface is there. Lacquer is really good with other lacquer because every time you put on a new layer of lacquer, it melts into the old layer of lacquer. So like lacquer is very, um, I guess you could call it like backwards compatible, like you can put on layers and and it'll work with the old layers and you can put on layers and and anticipate putting on future layers and not have to worry about it but something like poly also or poly known as polyurethane but everybody calls it poly they don't call it polyurethane but whenever you work with poly um i remember i told you i had a uh, ovation gp that i butchered that was a polyurethane finish polyurethane is very cheap it's common in guitars built in Korea, Japan, and China. Um, it's very, very cheap. It's a very strong chemical. It's sort of like syrup, like maple syrup. And basically the guitar is dipped in polyurethane and it envelops it. And so it's dipped in and the whole thing is enveloped in a clear coat and it's pulled out and the stuff is pulled off. But the, the guitar is dipped in it. You know, lacquer is sprayed on or it's painted on, but it's not dipped. You don't dip a guitar in lacquer. It's so thick and saturating, but poly, you do dip it in. So it's one continuous plastic envelope. It's like taking a piece of food and wrapping shrink wrap and then getting a heating gun and melting the shrink wrap onto the food. It's like it's melted into into it and it's one singular piece so what happens with a polyurethane finish is the only way to fix a polyurethane finish if for example you're like me and you own a poly guitar and your guitar gets damaged like mine did um, the only thing you can do is completely remove the finish and then you can put on like a spot of lacquer in the area where you remove the finish but it's never going to um, fully integrate with what was previously there so that's kind of the way that works. So um, yeah, one of the other things about summertime is the rats come out and I can kind of hear them chittering around a little bit. We've got a um, cherry tree in our backyard 
and um, well it's actually our neighbor's yard but a couple of the branches hang over on our side and so it drops cherries and the rats eat them and then we have a um, plum tree in our backyard though we actually it's actually in our yard it's not one of the neighbors trees it's it's on our property it's a big old plum tree and like hundreds of thousands literally hundreds of thousands of plums drop from it every year um, easily a hundred thousand plums maybe uh, 150,000 plums um, it's kind of crazy because they're really small and they just pile up it's insane and um, we get a garden rake out and we just rake them up but for like three months there's just plums it's awful because on one hand like you know at the beginning of the season you're like oh yeah plums and you get to eat some plums and it's like yeah but the thing is they're really really ripe and so they make you very uh, regular that would be the term <laughs> They make you very regular, um, which can be a good thing, I guess, if you're having intestinal issues. But um, generally speaking, I don't like being that regular, <laughs> you know, like every 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> um, and so you get tired of eating them, and then they keep growing, and then the rats keep coming and eating them. And then the other thing is that um, we have this fence that runs along the property line, of course, dividing, you know, the neighbor's house from ours. And the trees are, the two trees are up against the same fence, basically. And so um, the rats run along the fence, the top of it. They use it as a highway to cross between our house and the neighbor's house. And they cross this highway and it keeps them away from the cats, which definitely come into our yard at night because they know the rats are here eating. So the rats travel across this highway. This, you know, it's literally a highway because it's like, uh, I'd say that's eight feet off the ground, the fence. And, you know, the cats can't really walk around it because the top of the fence is too narrow for them. You know, it's only a few inches wide, but the rats can run across it without a problem. So they scamper back and forth. And then they, they grab fruit right off the tree. They don't even have to go to the ground and pick off the ones from the ground. They just go right up to the tree, they pluck it from the tree, and they continue scampering down the fence. It's kind of funny, actually. And like, I've got my light on here over here and I can kind of see them moving around the uh, top of the fence as I'm sitting here working. And I can hear them chittering a little bit to each other. It's kind of funny. They all got like little personalities. You know, this is my territory. That's my piece of fruit. Get away, you know. That's my female rat, you know. That's my male rat, you know. <laughs> I don't know if rats are um, all about gender equality or not. I don't know <laughs> if rats are progressive like that in their politics, but um, I can only imagine that's what they think and say to each other. Little arguments like that, and they chitter as they run across the fence and eating the fruit. Then come August, they have to get on the ground because all of the plums have fallen off the tree, and uh, they're all rotting on the ground, and then they eat the rotten fruit on the ground, and then that's when the cats come, and you'll hear the cats. Or you'll hear raccoons. Raccoons eat rats too. You hear the raccoons eating them. And you'll hear the cats try and eat them. But that's not until August. For now, it's the season of the rat because they're just running on that highway, picking them off the tree. It won't be the season of the cat until after all the plums have fallen on the ground. The plums and cherries. That's that one. Damn, let me do a little bit more. Man, I'm in a really good mood. I feel really relaxed. After this, I'm going to play my heart out. I'm going to go in and practice some Stevie Ray Vaughan and practice all my scales. Man, I am ready to practice. I'm in a really good mood. Go home, take a shower, drink a little coffee, eat a little dinner, and practice for like three hours. So the next thing for me to do for school is to start working on my multiple subject C set. So I'm going to start working on that probably 
not this week, but the following week. Um, basically, like, I'm going to take this week to get some work done for my client. I have a project that I'm doing. I probably mention it in other videos where I'm working on a If I have to pay him for half of it, you know, I'm fine with that, but I don't want to, you know, pay him a bunch of money. So if I can save on that, I will try to. So we'll start the teacher test prep again. While you guys were on pause, because um, I took a break and went inside to get a light, my dad came up and had a conversation with me. He was wondering if I was moving forward with my conversations with SF State. I told him I was going to go to SF State today. I did not go to SF State because I instead emailed the, the uh, graduate admissions uh, officer and asked them, you know, if I should come in and talk to you or if we can, you know, do everything through email. And she's like, oh, no, you can just do it through email. So I told him I was going to drive up there and talk to him, but that didn't happen because, you know, the graduate advisor said, you know, you don't need to come up, we don't need you to come up, we can answer your questions via email. So, I will go up when it's necessary to meet the teachers and the program director, but for now, I will just work with them via email, and my dad was kind of mad about that, but he was, you know, conciliatory because I told him, you know, but I've been emailing them and I'm in contact with them, so it was like, it wasn't like I flaked. But he really wants me to see me get into the program and start making steps towards it and kind of help him relax. We've been talking about it a lot. It bothers him when people talk about something and then it doesn't get done. And he feels like I flaked out on him because we were talking about the English credential and I was moving towards it as a goal and then I backed out of it in March because I went on my trip and I realized I don't want to be an English teacher. I don't really like teaching kids. I don't like teaching mainstream kids. And, um, it's just a very high stress environment. It's not really where I want to be. But special ed is awesome. It's very mellow and low key, and that's exactly what I like and exactly what I want out of a job. It's something that doesn't stress me out, even though it's like, you know, labor intensive work. It doesn't stress me out. I'm chill with doing it. So as long as like I'm relaxed and I'm able to do my work without stressing out, that's probably a good job, you know. The point of this day job is, you know, to have a job that will support me while I'm trying to get my art and music career started. You know, this isn't my sole career. At the same time, I don't want this to be a job that I hate. Like I was talking earlier about my friends who maybe didn't have the best priorities and they didn't exactly figure out their working situation the best. You know, they have a job that gets them by, but they hate it, and they, they barely get by. Some of them aren't even getting by. And um, the fact of the matter is it's gonna only get harder for them as they get older, and I'm trying to do the work up front now to get myself ahead so I don't struggle like that, because I don't want to suffer, and at least not any more than I have to, to get to my goal, you know? doesn't make sense to go through that kind of suffering to put yourself through a holocaust just to you know reach your dream that's the fastest way to actually kill your passion for your dream is to you know put yourself through so much shit that it you know, drives you insane and makes you depressed or angry or just somebody unpleasant somebody toxic you don't want to be toxic if you're toxic it's like nobody wants to be around you what's the point of achieving your dream if you hate the fact that you actually got there, you know, you want to achieve your dream and enjoy it, or at least try to achieve your dream and enjoy the process of going for it, you know, and that's the real secret, it's tough though, it's real tough sometimes, um, so he's worried about that, and I understand why he's worried, but I am taking the steps to make the progress to go forward and to make this actual legitimate career transition. I'm, I'm very confident in that. It's just, you know, a little slow going because things changed and he is upset about the fact that I changed and he's waiting to see if I actually am as committed as I say I am and I am. He's just doubtful, which is fine. He has the right to be doubtful. I did change my mind on him and my mom 
so he has fair cause to be doubtful, but I have the means to assail him of his fears and doubts. I do have the means because I do actually intend to commit and follow through and, and, and get, not only intend, but I will commit and follow through. I have been. You know, the first step to actually getting into the special ed credential and, and just into that career as a whole was completing my long-term assignment as a substitute over at Trace. So now that I've completed that, it's it's been shown to my, my former employer that like I am a worthy prospect and, and a worthwhile employee. And instead of being a substitute, my goal is to get called in mid to late June and get employed at Trace full time. So that starting next semester, instead of worrying about, you know, am I gonna sub or am I gonna be doing this or that or where am I gonna sub? If I do end up subbing, I'll just be at Trace. And then with that sort of steadfast and like consistent sort of employment, I won't have to stress about, you know, which school am I subbing at today? Or where am I gonna be? How long is my commute gonna be? Who am I dealing with? What subject am I gonna teach? Because subbing is chaos. I hate subbing. I never want to actually be a substitute teacher. I hate it. I recommend that you sub for a year if you plan on going into teaching to see if you're capable of it, but then, you know, very quickly make a decision as to what branch or avenue you're gonna go into. You know. A lot of people were kind of surprised when I jumped on the VI credential, but it was very clear to me that I didn't like mainstream and that I did like special ed. And so when my boss told me, well, hey, this is an avenue that's available to you, it was like, yeah, I'll do it. Even though I didn't really fully understand what the offer was and the opportunity and like the nature of the commitment, I was willing to just say yes because it made sense for what I was looking for at the time. So I don't always recommend making decisions like that, but in that case, making a snap decision like that was really good. Ironically, that's a very quick decision and a very quick sort of step of movement and growth that I don't think my father recognizes, but it was a big, very quick, decisive movement that I made. And, you know, I was really lucky. I was really lucky that I landed in Trace and found something that I could do that didn't make me want to like put a bullet in my head. You know, if you are going to do what I'm doing and that's try to have, you know, basically three careers at once, your day job, your secondary career, and then, you know, all the work you do to manage your secondary career. So like my secondary career is my art, my music, my writing. And then the secondary part of that or the, the, the managing of that secondary career is like running my business and like managing the website and putting videos out like this and doing the video editing and doing photo editing and and stuff like it's fun producing a video but it's like tedious and very time consuming to edit a video or to edit you know 50 photographs for a vet graduating class or you know to it's really fun and easy to design a brochure but then to tweak it and really make the individual assets for it and really get it like 100% dialed in, you know, that part's difficult. And then, you know, writing a contract for your client. I spent damn near four hours working on my contract, actually probably more like five hours working on writing the terms of the contract so that I could have it roughly done by like Friday. So I can send it to my client on Friday and he can look at it all day Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday when I approach them both about it, it's like they look at it and they think, oh, okay, this makes sense we're gonna go forward with it you know my client is John and Melanie I'm not gonna give you their last name but John and Melanie or Melody excuse me John and Melody um, she goes by Mel um, you know I want to um, give them enough time to look at my terms so that they can understand what it is they're getting into and can understand you know the nature of the agreement and you know see if they can actually meet that commitment and you know, if they have any questions or concerns, they can address them fairly and you know, with enough time to review the contract where when you meet up on Sunday, they aren't totally blindsided by it. And also you know, the fact that uh, you know, because I give them time, it's, it's also very, it's, it's a polite sort of courtesy to not like ambush your client with a contract, but to give them time to mull it over. So, that's one of the other things that I'm trying to do is get it to them as soon as possible so that they can you know, have the adequate time to get through it and you know, make a very wise decision as to whether they do agree or disagree 
or if they have revisions. And, you know, what are those revisions or whatever. So I, I'm doing a lot at once. It's just sometimes frustrating because my dad gets really fixated on like one aspect of my work and he doesn't see any of the other things I'm doing sometimes. And then sometimes I get really frustrated by that and I don't see, you know, how, you know, the number of ways in which he supports me and the number of ways in which he kind of like tolerates my crazy bullshit because, God, I am pretty erratic sometimes and I have to, you know, be better about that. But that's the nature of life. It's a lot of give and take and negotiating and you just have to be flexible and willing to adapt to successfully navigate it, you know. That's part of the reason why I'm trying to give my client the contract early is because I not only believe in that, but I'm trying to practice that and show respect to other people, you know, by giving them the ability to negotiate and navigate, you know, complicated, multifaceted agreements, you know. It's just a big jigsaw puzzle and like the center of it is still a mess, but I have all the edges outlined. Like I have all the corners outlined. I have the entire edge, all four edges. I have the day job outlined. Like I'm about to have it fully outlined. That's the last like corner edge I have to get, you know, filled in. But I get that day job lined up and I get this program lined up. And then on the other hand, I have my career, my secondary career and the management of it. And those are the four corners. And then the puzzle is ready to be built. You know, you can't, solve the inner part of the puzzle until you have the outer edge built that's just it and i'm at the point where like i'm turning that corner and then the rest will be filling in that detail always draw your outline before you draw the interior that's something i also practice i don't just preach it that's how i do all my drawings so with that i am done I have sanded and polished this through every single available grit and it is ready now for the finish. I'll see you guys tomorrow. This is the acid grit. Thanks for watching.